Those were wonderful words which have really lifted our spirits. We will now turn to our Bible reading for this week, which is taken from John chapter 15, starting at verse 1. And this is the vine and the branches, words that are familiar to us all. John 15, starting at verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray together now as we prepare our hearts to study God's word. Father God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that we have it in a language that we can understand. And we do just pray that as we think about this passage now, that you will open our eyes, our hearts to the meaning of your word. Lord, we want to learn more about you. We want to learn to love you more. We want to learn to glorify your holy name and to be the uh, servants that you want us to be. So we do just pray that as we read this passage, you would open its meaning to us and write your words on our hearts so that we will be people who know how to behave in a way that brings glory to you in every situation that we face. Amen. Well, please keep your Bibles open at John chapter 15. One of the great joys in life is the simple pleasure of enjoying a good meal. Food dominates our lives and shapes our days. Breakfast, then lunch or dinner, then dinner or should I say tea. These meals divide our days up and are an essential part of our routine. Where would we be without food? In the short term, hungry and probably unhappy. In the long term, no food or even a lack of food is life threatening. Food is something that we all have to ingest, something that we all have to take in. It is not something that we can generate ourselves from within ourselves, but it is something that must come from outside. Everybody understands the importance of physical food to give us the strength we need for the day and to nourish ourselves so that we are healthy. However, a lot of people, including some Christians, they don't seem to realize that in addition to physical food, we also need some spiritual food. Nourishment that helps our inner being to be happy, healthy and also fruitful. Now, just like physical food, this spiritual food is not something that we can generate within ourselves. Instead, it is something that must come from outside. 
And as Jesus explained in this important parable in John 15, he is the only one who can provide his disciples with the spiritual nourishment that they need to live happy, healthy and fruitful lives. This parable of the vine and the branches uses imagery that would have been very familiar to the disciples. And for those of us who have got gardens today, we are familiar with it as well. Jesus uses this image to describe how the disciples were, would be able to keep on going and to keep on getting the strength to keep on going. A strength that does not come from within themselves, but rather flows from Jesus into them, which results in the disciples being fruitful. And as we approach this little parable, the first thing that stands out is that Jesus is the vine. Now, for those of us who know our Bible, we will recognize that this is not just a random plant that's being picked out of the air, but rather the vine is a plant which carries a deep spiritual meaning. In the Psalms, then Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Hosea, we see vines or vineyards being mentioned. And every time a vine or a vineyard is being mentioned, it is a reference to the nation of Israel and how they have not been fruitful in the way that God wanted them to be. Now here in John's Gospel, we see Jesus describing himself as the true vine, the one who would fulfill what God intended the nation of Israel to achieve. Through the obedience of Jesus to the Father, the nations will be brought into the right relationship with God and his holy name will be worshipped and praised. Now it is important to notice that the phrase true vine is applied just to Christ, not to the branches. They are attached to him and draw their nourishment from him. Jesus and Jesus alone is the true vine and the father is the gardener. Here we see the wonderful partnership between the father and the son when it comes to salvation. When we were sinners, God was always distant and rightfully judgmental. But when we trust in Christ, we see the love of God through the sacrifice of his son and we enter into a new and trusting relationship with him. Now we see and experience the love of God and the love that we experience is a true love that gives us what we really need and stops us making mistakes. A love which puts us into situations and circumstances that result in genuine, fruitful growth. This is the pruning process which can be painful at times, but it is essential. If you are growing a vine with the intention of getting grapes, it needs to be carefully pruned. Dead and diseased wood must be taken away while side shoots are removed so that all of the nourishment goes to the fruit. You will never get good fruit from an unprimed, unpruned vine. Likewise, in our lives, God stops us going in the wrong directions. He shields us from situations that we could not cope with. Often, this will include not giving us what we want, because he knows that if we receive our heart's desire, it would just hurt us or damage our relationship with him. In fact, one of the worst things that God can do to any person is to let them do whatever they want. This is a sure road to a lost eternity. The Father's pruning includes allowing situations to develop in our lives, which uh, expose hidden sins that need turning away from or will reveal the futility of living for things other than God. We are able to rejoice at this pruning because we know that at a personal level, it results in us being healthy Christians. And at the more important level, it will make us fruitful, which brings glory to God, which should be our heart's desire. Isn't it wonderful that some of the things that we do are fruit that brings glory to God? When we, re we remember what we are, we are sinners saved by grace. Isn't it incredible that we can be used for such a noble purpose as glorifying God's name? Yet this is exactly what happens. God uses us to bear fruit and this fruit brings glory to him. This fruit grows and develops because of our connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like when we were saved and Christ does all the work then, so the ability to be fruitful comes entirely by God's grace as Christ spiritually nourishes us. This points to the importance of the indwelling Holy Spirit who is present within every believer. Just like the nourishment from a vine that will make the grapes swell and ripen as it flows through the branches, so the grace of God flows through us, making us fruitful. 
I suppose a very simple illustration would be like um, a person filling up a water balloon from a tap. The tap is turned on and the water flows through the tap and into the balloon, filling it up. And the grace of Christ flows through the believer, making them fruitful, making their fruit mature and grow. And these deeds and actions, which are our fruitful behaviour, bring glory to God. So this leads us to an important question. What does it mean to be fruitful? And this is important because when we look at this passage, we see that branches that are not fruitful are cut out and burnt. I remember years ago hearing a sermon on this passage, and it spoke about fruit being simply as people who had turned to Christ because of our witness. Being fruitful was limited to being a successful evangelist. And at the time that filled me with fear because I'm a fairly quiet person. And at that point, I had not been involved in helping anyone turn to Christ. So I was thinking, am I an unfruitful branch? Am I going to be cut out? Well, now I'm a little bit older and I know the scriptures a little bit better. And I now know that it is impossible for someone who has trusted in Christ, who has repented of their sins and been justified to lose their salvation. Justification is God saying that there are no charges against the individual. Their sin has been removed. And once God has made that legal declaration, then the person is forgiven forever. Their sins have been completely covered with Christ's blood. So, if we can't lose our salvation, what does it mean when it talks about branches being cut out? And then what does it mean to be fruitful? Well, in the immediate context of this passage, someone who is cut out is clearly a false disciple like Judas Iscariot. In the wider context of the New Testament, we can think about those who were part of the church, but then left the church and started spreading false teaching. And then at the even bigger national level, we can turn to maybe Romans 11, where Paul talked about another plant. He talked about an olive tree and how the branches of that were broken off and then other branches were engrafted in. For us today, it is a sad truth that not everyone who attends a church or even claims to follow Christ is a true believer. Some people are just brought up in church going families and they're told that they are saved. Others delude themselves going through the motions, but deep down they have never repented of their sin. People attend church for many different reasons and it is hard for us to really know what is going on inside, but God does. He sees the heart and in order to help us, he has given us little pointers, which while they don't give us certain information, they do help us to know if someone is truly saved. We have to remember that Jesus once said, by their fruit, you will know them. That is, those who are true believers. And all true believers will show some genuine fruit in their lives. So this leads us on to what does it mean to be fruitful? What is the sort of fruit that we see in scripture? Well, there are many different kinds of fruit. First of all, we have to acknowledge that each and every Christian is a fruit themselves. All of us have heard the gospel and responded to it. And that means we are the product of someone else's evangelism. Someone shared the gospel with us. But in addition to us being fruit ourselves, we are branches and we have our own fruit growing on it. And one of these is our witness to other people. Evangelism is important. We should desire the people around us to hear the message from us and respond with saving faith. And while we are not responsible for that faith grown in their lives, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Lord, does use us as the means of sharing the gospel with the people around us. So we should seek to be fruitful in this area. But evangelism is not the only kind of fruit. There is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. That's that growth in those characteristics which are good and pleasing to the Lord. This is sanctification or growth in godliness, becoming more and more like Jesus. So there is another whole host of different kinds of fruit that we could be showing here there. Another form of fruit is sharing the love of Christ having his heart for the weak and helpless and, she and seeking to show Christ's love to them. 
And the final form of fruit I'd like to mention is praise and worship of God. Today, this is an easy one to identify in our lives. For those of us who are gathering together um, in public, at the public worship, we're not allowed to sing, and that really hurts. If you are at home and you're missing meeting up with the, the Christians, and that really hurts, that's a sign that you want to sing out the Lord's praises with other Christians and worship him as part of the gathered assembly of saints. If you're feeling that way, then that is a sign of spiritual fruit in your life. Our saviour, mediator, master, lord and friend, he has provided us with many different ways that we can be fruitful and he gives us the strength that we need to continue being fruitful in his service as long as his people remain in him. This spiritual link between us and Christ is a wonderful gift, a gift that we appreciate more when we recognise that it is a pale reflection of the relationship between the Father and the Son. Startling as this sounds, it's what we read in John 15 verses 9 and 10. Just look at those verses and listen to what Jesus is saying. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. As the theologian and Bible commentator Don Carson writes, the relationship between the Father and the Son is frequently set forth in chapters 13 to 17 as the paradigm for the relationship between Jesus and his disciples. A paradigm is a model for us to follow. We are to love and obey Christ like Christ loves the Father. And when we do this, then we remain in him and we remain in his love. As we will learn in John 17, this restored relationship with God, a relationship that comes to us entirely through grace and love, is what eternal life really is. All those who know the love of Jesus, who remain in him under the tender care of the Father and Son, filled with the Holy Spirit, know true peace with God. And this brings us genuine joy, the joy of being in a loving relationship, knowing that you are accepted and cared for, the joy of knowing the love that Christ has shown you in rescuing you from your sins, and the joy that grows as we see fruits developing in our lives. I suppose this latter one is a bit like the happiness that a mill worker feels when they've had a good day. They've exceeded their quota and everything they've worked on has passed quality control. They have the satisfaction of knowing that a job has been well done. For believers, we feel this joy when we see Christ's fruit growing in our lives, not because of our own efforts, but because of his grace and love. And we are called to remain in his love, showing this love to him and to our brothers and sisters in Christ. This area of showing love uh, of Christ's love is an area where we often fall a long way behind our master. Jesus loved his disciples. He loved those who would trust in him so much that he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for them and die on the cross. His command to his followers is to show the same kind of sacrificial love, even to other Christians. This love is the kind of love that you find in caring families who make great sacrifices to provide for each other. When we trust in Christ, we are adopted into his family, which means other Christians also become our family members, so we should do what is best for them, which will often mean coming along to church in order to give something or to share something, rather than attending simply so that the people at the front can provide for your needs. The sort of love we are to cultivate for one another is a generous love that seeks to give. We show this love in the church when we exercise the gifts that the Lord has given us for the building up of his church. This community of believers is a wonderful group to be part of. It brings many benefits which are obvious and some which are truly staggering. And Jesus now refers to something truly amazing. He elevates his disciples from servants to friends. At face value, we may not think much of this until we remember who Jesus is. He is the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity. And then we remember that only two people in the Old Testament clearly had the label as a friend of God, Abraham and Moses. Now Jesus extends the same status to those who trust in him. 
to those who are branches of the vine, to those who remain in him and are obedient to his commands. This is a great honour which carries with it a solemn responsibility. The Greek word for friend used here is what would be applied to the inner circle around a king in a royal court. These people share the confidence of the king, yet at the same time they are eager to do whatever the monarch asks. The disciples, and by extension all believers, are the trusted friends of the king, and they live to do his bidding. This willingness to serve Christ is an essential feature of the Christian. According to verse 16, we have been chosen and appointed to go and bear fruit for Christ. God's choice of us was not to like sticking a pin in the telephone directory to find a number. Maybe for the younger ones, I should say, randomly dial in numbers to see who you connect with. Rather, we were chosen specifically to do a job. God has got something special for each believer. It is like each one of us is a unique piece of a jigsaw. We are called to go and bear fruit for our master. What that fruit is depends upon who we are. But whatever it is, the ability to produce this fruit flows from our friend, master, lord and king. Therefore, the Christian can be confident that when they pray in Jesus' name, which is to pray the sort of prayer that Jesus would pray, then they can be confident that God will answer. He will answer because our prayers will be about us bearing the fruit that he has assigned to each one of us. Our prayer is an acknowledgement that our strength to be fruitful comes from God alone. From this passage, we can draw some important take home truths. Firstly, it is clear for the Christian, loving other believers is essential. Sometimes this is easy. Other times it is hard. Because even after we are saved, believers do make mistakes, we fall into sin and give into temptation. And the enemy always tries to destroy the unity of the church. And when that happens, people get hurt. Which means at times, we do upset and hurt one another. We need to be ready to forgive and also willing to acknowledge guilt in order to restore relationships. An unloving Christian will never be fruitful. They may carry on for a while in their own strength, but ultimately the one who prunes will sort them out. So we should repent of our sins before we come under the Lord's discipline. Secondly, we should never limit our ambition to our own strength because we don't actually have any. Even though this is hard to hear, it is what Jesus says. Look at the end of verse five. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. When it comes to serving the Lord, when it comes to doing the things he wants us to do, uh, do, we often look at ourselves and we think we can't do that. Well, in our own strength, we can't. We can only be fruitful in the Lord's strength. So knowing this, it means that the sky should be the limit to our ambitions for him. He can do all things and much to our joy, he chooses to work through us. Let's be people who are willing to pray big prayers, knowing that nothing is impossible for God. And finally, let us make sure that we remain in him. Throughout the New Testament, there are repeated calls for the believer to keep on going. While theologically we know that a genuine Christian cannot lose their salvation, we also know that a genuine Christian will always keep on going to the end. So we need to hang in there, no matter how hard life gets, and we can do this not because of our own ability, but because the strength of Christ flows through all of the branches, allowing us to live happy, helpful and fruitful lives. We do this because the Lord Jesus is the one who gives us the strength that we need to keep on going. Let us pray together. Father God, we do thank you that you are the one who gives us the strength to keep on going through your son, our saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do just pray that you help each one of us to be fruitful in our lives today. At whatever stage we are in life, we pray, Lord, that you will bring glory to your name by the, the way that we behave as Christians. Help us to seek out those opportunities to um, tell others about the love of Jesus, to share the gospel with them. And we pray, Lord, that you will work in our lives so that we can pick up those fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5. 
Lord, we do just pray that we will grow in love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. Father God, we do just ask that you bless us in this area. And Lord, we long to be able to show the love of Christ to the needy around us. Please open doors and opportunities for us to do this. And finally, Lord, we love to praise and worship your name. And we do just pray that our worship of you will be fruit that brings glory to your name. Father God, we do just thank you we, that we have the great honour and the noble task of being fruitful for you. Oh Lord, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Amen. Well, the final song that we have in our playlist now is a song from Sovereign Grace. And it's all about the love of Jesus, how vast and great and strong his love is. Let's praise the Lord together now as we look at this video and sing this song. 